Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to comment on this very interesting research. Uh, my recognition to the three presenters, and uh, thank you again to the wider conference for giving me this opportunity. So I think some key questions came to my mind when I, when I, when I heard the presentation, and I want to sh share some of them with you, and obviously we can discuss them uh, if time permits. Uh, as a former public servant that had to deal with issues of security and organized crime in the city of Cali, for instance, which is very different from, from Medellin, and we can talk a little bit about that, but uh, just to give you uh, some context, uh, Cali has a much less organized, organized crime, and therefore a much higher level of violence. And I think one of the key insights that I gather from the presentation is this trade-off between the levels of violence versus the control of organized crime in a, in a city or in a, in a country even. So I think policymakers fa face a terrible choice. I think uh, Chris Blattman has called it a terrible choice between fighting and organized crime and reducing the uh, influence of, of organized crime, like Giancarlo mentioned, uh, it's been done in Italy, versus the level of violence that that may generate. So, but even before getting into that, the, the key question I, I, I have, and, and the key, the, one of the key conclusions that I have as a former public servant in Colombia is, what is what sort of a strategic level intelligence capabilities do states have regarding organized crime and gangs? And I think my my point of view is that we have a very poor understanding governments in general have a very poor understanding at the strategic level of uh, organized crime and gangs and i think researchers like chris blattman like uh, uh, santiago like uh, ben like giancarlo help us understand better organized crime but i think researchers cannot fully um, fill this gap this void I think we need much better intelligence on the side of the government to understand um, uh, the the capacities, the way of, 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 of gangs, how they operate, and their strategic interests. And I think uh, governments in general tend to be a little bit naive in terms of understanding uh, how they operate and how they, they function. So what sort of information we need to evaluate and analyze different policies? I think Giancarlo pointed to some uh, very interesting uh, examples of how to uh, analyze and how to measure uh, the effectiveness. But in general, I think we, uh, as civilian leaders, need much better tools to evaluate the balance of power, for instance, between organized crime and national police. And one key problem we have is our source, uh, the source of information for uh, civilian leaders is the police itself. So how objective is the police going to be in informing uh, civic or uh, civilian leaders of, of, of the balance of power between uh, these uh, sort of the tools of, of, of the state to guarantee security, basically the police forces versus uh, organized crime. Another thing I wanted to mention is how do we, br how do we help uh, bridge the gap between the traditional point of view, the traditional tactics and methods, which I think are favored by public opinion and therefore favored by politicians. But unfortunately, as, as Ben discussed, there's very little evidence that they are effective. So uh, the traditional point of view of repression, incarceration, criminalization of the drug trade, etc., is still much, uh, much favored by the public opinion and therefore by politicians. But as the research shows, there seems to be significant questions uh, how effective they are in actually fighting organized crime. Um, so how can we take a better look at a more nuanced approach in terms of fighting organized crime and gangs? And like I mentioned before, one of the key questions that also comes to my mind is, should governments focus on reducing violence or should they focus on dismantling organized crime? And I think Santiago rightly points out that it's usually not a black or white answer. It's probably gonna be somewhere in the middle, but I think we lack the tools and we lack the framework to fully analyze and fully discuss exactly how. Uh, an example from Colombia uh, comes to my mind, uh, and it actually has a lot of political relevance right now because one of the two leading candidates for president, his name is Federico Gutierrez. He's a former mayor of Medellin. And he has faced criticism because during his tenure, uh, 
murder, the murder rate in Medellin started to climb again after de decades of reducing. And he has claimed that it's because he decided to face combos and razones and to uh, at least attempt to dismantle part of their power. Um, but that generated, in fact, uh, a higher level of violence in, in Medellin. And likewise, previous mayors of Medellin have been accused, quote unquote, of uh, making uh, pacts with, uh, with, the, with the combos to reduce violence. So at what cost in terms of state legitimacy, et cetera. And I think ca the, the contrast between Cali and, and Medellin illustrate that point of, of, of a city like Cali where organized crime is much less organized, much less powerful. We have fewer um, documented cases of extortion compared to Medellin. But at the same time, we have a weaker city government and a much higher level of violence. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting how Ben made us question that traditional point of view of um, crime flourishing where states are weak, where in fact we see comparing different cities and even parts of the city in Medellin that actually they, they are not, um, they don't replace each other, they actually coexist and complement each other, which I think is rather interesting. Um, and uh, the, the conclusion that Ben presents, how criminal governance is actually useful to states, it's something very prov provocative that I, I, I personally had not considered before. I, I agree with Santiago that we definitely need more research on organized crime. But again, like I said before, we need more and better capabilities from, from the states, from the governments, to do um, better analysis and have strategic intelligence on the way these um, organizations operate. Uh, and finally, I also wanted to uh, point out that uh, what Gianmarco mentioned about Italy's uh, murder rate being uh, half of Finland's. I, to be honest with you, I had to look it up because I, was, I had a difficulty believing it. And it turns out it's not half, it's like almost a third uh, uh, of Italy's. I think uh, of Finland's. Finland's is uh, close to 1.3, 1.5 in the range, and Italy's is 0 0.5. And, um, and that, again, brings us to the previous uh, question that I brought up, which is, what do we prefer? Do we, I, it, it's difficult to, take, uh, to make a decision. Do we prefer, I, I, I would say, many, many people would say a situation like Finland is better than Italy's, you, you would argue, but at the same time, you have triple the level of violence. So, uh, of course, Finland is still very low for, for, even for, for European standards, but, but it's interesting how this trade-off uh, between violence versus criminal control is there, and it's something that politicians avoid talking about. It's something the public probably doesn't, is not fully aware of, but it's something that has to be, uh, I think, a key part of the discussion uh, when we discuss state legitimacy and also the welfare of communities. And of course, violence plays a huge role in, in, in the establishing and uh, the level of, of welfare that, that citizens experience. So I hope these uh, questions are um, a good starting point for our discussion, and I think we have some, some time to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I can feel and see. Maybe we'll just get the panel to sort of sit up here, and then we'll um, we'll take the questions. Right. We've got plenty of time, so um, I'll just sort of start maybe here at the front, and then work our way um, uh, back through. Uh, let's take them in batches of three, and I'll I'll make sure I get to all of you. Morning. Thanks so much for, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thanks so much for an excellent panel. Um, so I have a question for Ben. So Ben, your question is, why don't states retrain their capacity to curb criminal governance? And you don't talk much about the demand side, which is something that Andres just mentioned, which is the overwhelming support for what you may call penal populism or hardline uh, public security policies. And I'm wondering how you think that plays into um, the story that you're trying to tell in Brazil. We know that citizens overwhelmingly support policies that are ineffective, but that make them feel like the government is, is taking action. And mass incarceration is one of those, military policing is another. There are all sorts of, there's a collection of policies that citizens, despite the fact, even learning that they're ineffective, will still continue to support. Thanks. You just introduce yourself, oh, yeah. Michael. I'm sorry. I'm Michael Weintraub, Universidad de Los Andes. I'm part of the Colombian combo here. 
Okay, thank you. And then the lady here in front, please, in the second row. Hi, I'm Marina. I'm from Auto University. Uh, my question is for Benjamin. So I was wondering if you could provide some thoughts on how the rise um, in the number of militias, especially in the state of Rio de Janeiro, is changing um, the dynamics in organized crime in Brazil. Because one can argue that uh, the militias are quite different from these previous criminal factions uh, that you showed, like Comando Vermelho and PCC. Uh, they have stronger ties to the Brazilian state. You know, they are members are mostly composed of uh, policemen, are they retired or not? And also they have like these alternative sources of revenues, not only coming from the drug traf traffic, but also from charging fees from the population that lives under their controlled areas. And maybe how this translates into uh, violence indicators in the country. Thank you very much. I have one more, the um, gentleman in the green um, jumper behind you. Thank you. I'm Andy Hinsley from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. So I'd like to ask about the implications for economic development. So we heard in the Italian case that um, employment growth was stronger when, when the law was applied. But in, in Colombia and Brazil, uh, what, are the, what are the implications of these uh, tolerance equilibria that, that you can see for economic development. So you could definitely imagine that the, the high violence equilibrium in, in the crackdown case would be very negative for investment and, and growth. Um, how, how constraining are the, the tolerance equilibriums for, for growth and investment? And what, what are the sort of longer term implications for the trajectory of, of economic development if that's allowed to continue? Thank you very much. So there were a couple of questions for um, Ben, Benjamin, um, over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks for those great questions. Um, so, Michael, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's huge demand for hardline policing. It's part of how this whole thing, hardline policing, mass incarceration, uh, of course, drug repression, and that, and I wouldn't deny that at all. Uh, I think it's it's part and parcel of how this works. I would say two things. First of all, um, you know, there's the demand for all kinds of policies, but that doesn't make those policies sustainable over time. People would love like helicopter drops of money, but that would lead to inflation, and so you can't just keep doing that. So part of what I'm trying to talk about is how this is sustainable over time. But also it's important to, to be clear that the hardline policies is part of how this system of criminal governance it is stable. It's, hard, it's part of what keeps the criminal uh, groups, it's part of what gives them incentives to govern. So, you know, you're not going to get prison-based criminal governance unless you have a huge prison population, overcrowded prisons, which is partly driven by this demand for lock them up, you know, throw them away, throw away the key, long prison sentences, terrible prison conditions, and it's precisely the kind of demand for the policy, the, the, the political popularity of the kind of policies you're talking about. Um, and part of what gives drug traffickers uh, incentives to govern in the in the favelas is the violent policing around the drug trade. So they know that if they if police get called in, there's likely to be shooting violence against them. And so it gives them all the more incentive to govern. So I, I wouldn't say that, I, I think the two things go hand in hand. But the militias, you know, this is a fascinating and, and terrifying development where, I, you know, I showed you on that map, all the red dots are the Commando Vermelli, the traditional prison-based drug gangs, and all the blue dots are these police-linked militias the fastest growing form of criminal of, of, of organized crime in Rio and probably spreading throughout Brazil while we're not even aware of it. That way that I showed you that the factions, the prison gangs spread through Brazil in 2010 to 2020, everybody denied it, all the officials denied it until it was too late. By 2018, you know, officials, governors were saying, we don't have these gangs, they don't exist, they only exist in Rio, they already existed in their states. And so before anyone knew it, the whole country was factionalized. Well, I believe the milicias are probably spreading right now. But a people, you know, officials will still tell you, oh no, milicias, that's a Rio thing. It's a, it's a terrifying new model because milicias are active duty police officers who are extorting marginalized populations, uh, you know, when they're sort of off duty. So it's, it's, a, it's very much a nightmare. They're very hard to combat because these are, you know, actual active duty members of the police. Um, that said, you'll notice that they're not very active where there's high value retail drug markets. 
So it does seem like there's a kind of equilibrium where the traditional demonized, uh, sort of very marginalized groups who are make up these command of humanity drug factions, often from much more lower class backgrounds, much more poor backgrounds, uh, often racialized as well, uh, are, are left to deal with the dirty job of extracting money from the drug trade, which then gets paid through corruption up the ranks, while these police-linked militias are left to govern the sort of less lucrative, more spread out zones of the city where they have to live off of extortion of the local population. Thank you very much. Um, so on the third question, on the sort of tolerance to vo or towards violence, I'd like to um, ask. Yes, uh, thank you. So just like a couple of comments there. Uh, if we think about like local economic development, like on one hand, uh, I guess having a criminal organization that regulates violence and controls the territory might actually induce some sort of development because of like violence reduction might lead to kids being, for instance, more able to go to school, or people more able to go to work, or maybe more incentives to maybe open some sort of businesses. But on the other hand, what we have seen, uh, not only in Medellin, but also in Rio de Janeiro, in El Salvador, and this seems to be a pattern, is that these groups, uh, the, the, the main aim of these combos in Medellin, for instance, is to like sell drugs at the beginning. Uh, and to do that, you need to be able to enforce a local monopoly. So you need to be able to develop enough coercive capacity to protect that monopoly. And then once you have like territorial control, uh, the marginal cost of diversifying into other businesses is very low. So you can start, for instance, to monopolize uh, legal markets on gas canisters, on cable TV, on uh, even like dairy products, eggs, and many other like uh, 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 consumer goods. Uh, and that's what they're doing in Medellin. That's what we have been also observing in some surveys that we've been running in Rio de Janeiro, for instance. That's also been happening in Salvador. And this is just a restriction of competition, right? So we've been observing, for instance, these groups in Medellin colluding with distributors of gas canisters to protect monopolies. So a distributor of gas canisters would arrive to the, to the street gang, to the combo, and would offer them some money in exchange of the combo protecting the monopoly for this group. So there's like this like very gray uh, uh, and shady kind of uh, uh, hinder on local economic development that's actually hard to observe, how to, hard to like tailor and track, and, 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 and potentially has like long-term uh, uh, very damaging impacts. So it's, it's a good question with like uh, very like, difficult answers, I think. Okay. So, um, no. okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm speculating here, but I think part of the story is about uh, state capacity. So if you look uh, at uh, the level of homicides in Italy at the beginning of the 90s was similar, very similar, the same to Mexico in 2006. 2007 in Mexico, the drug war starts, and this is an ex ex escalation of violence that is still uh, uh, nowadays, we see a like, linear increase in the number of homicides in Mexico, and now it's much, much higher than it was in 2006. So there is a lot of debate of whether the Mexican drug war was uh, successful uh, or not. Uh, conversely, in the Italian case, there was uh, this big crackdown at the beginning of the 90s, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, now the homicide rate uh, is very low, although criminal organizations uh, uh, have not been defeated. And I think the difference, at least a part of the difference, is about uh, state uh, capacity. So if you look uh, at uh, those two indicators, homicides was uh, the same in Italy and Mexico in those two periods, state capacity was very different if you look at uh, you know, World Bank uh, indicators and so on. And I think uh, this uh, could be an important uh, element to understand why crackdowns might, uh, might work uh, or not in different uh, scenarios. Of course, there are other differences also uh, across the two countries and the way criminal organizations work. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, as uh, uh, in this morning presentation, uh, Tom was saying, this state capacity it can matter a lot. Thank you. So I'll go to the left now. Um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, just yeah. Just Eric. Just wait for the mic. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Uh, Eric Worker from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, where we're one of the most liberal cities in North America for drug policy. And thanks for the fascinating papers. I wanted to pick up on the question from Michael on the exchange with Ben. Um, you've all described the relationship with drug repression and the existence of, of formal um, 
gangs, basically. And 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 uh, my question is, and 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 you've also talked about the trade-off between violence and legitimacy. And I guess why not consider the trade-off between legitimacy uh, that comes from having a war with gangs versus legitimacy from decriminalizing drugs. And, you know, you have on the one hand drug users, but then the state's response to drug users is harm reduction and education, which would seem to be further legitimacy enhancing uh, activities. And then an, a sort of a meta question is, do we as researchers on, the th on these things have a responsibility to model perhaps off equilibrium policy alternatives to make those more realistic in the in the context. Thanks. Anybody else from this side? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Rinchen from the University of Kent. I had a question for Jen Marco. I think you, you, you uh, thanks for your presentation. I so what I understand from what the Italian government did was dissolving local municipal assemblies and then basically in interim setup controlled by technocrats until the next electoral cycle happens. But I would like to know a bit more about what were the fundamental conditions that were changed during that interim setup. Because you know, usually when you look at elections, you have an electoral cycle, the interim government is just there to hold new elections and nothing really fundamentally changes on the ground because they don't have the mandate to do anything apart from holding the next elections. So with regards to local propensity for conflict or local propensity for gang violence, for instance, what were these bureaucrats doing during the interim period that made a difference uh, to you know the new regime coming in, so to speak? Or was it a case that some other shock happened around the same time of this dissolution, which is really driving the result? Anybody else over there? I saw the uh, uh, hand up at the very back there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jackson uh, from Conflict Research Network, West Africa. Uh, I, want, I want to ask a general question. Uh, from the presentation, I observed that uh, it implies that both in uh, stronger states and fragile weaker states like we have in Africa, uh, gang wars and uh, gang uh, governance issues are there. Uh, so in that case, uh, does it have anything uh, to, to do with the regime type and the regime system that is being practiced uh, across, across the, uh, the, the zones? Uh, then secondly, uh, if all the uh, policy initiatives uh, the, uh, the governments have been using, like for instance, uh, the incarceration approach or uh, removing uh, uh, public officials from office, you know, if it's, if it's not uh, effective enough, are there any alternative uh, contextual community-based approaches that can be applied as against uh, top-bottom uh, state-based approaches which hasn't addressed the issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to start on this? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, just like a, a couple of words on legalization, because I do think that, let's just think about Europe in general, right? So most likely in every city in Europe and probably here in Helsinki, you'll find a market for cocaine, right? Uh, and the problem of this market being illegal is that regulation has to come from some illegal organization. So I think that keeping drugs illegal is just a permanent incentive for organized crime to grow stronger, right? Uh, what would happen if we legalize drugs? Uh, it's hard to think that the, all these groups would just move to the legal sector. Some of them might just remain in the illegal sector by exploiting other sort of uh, opportunities. Uh, but it would certainly reduce the size of the pie because the rents are going to be smaller. And most likely, that's my speculation, uh, the problem of organized crime will be less like, damaging and, 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 and hard. Uh, this all, all, like, has another side, which is, uh, what is related to what Michael mentioned before, which is like, public support for legalization is, 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 is hard. But I do think that we need to uh, think of uh, that path as a potential solution. I can't imagine, like, uh, like the, the war on drugs, for instance, has been, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, ongoing for 50 years, and, and the only thing that has happened is that we now see more drug use uh, all over the world. Uh, 
so it's hard to think that if we continue doing this in 50 years, there's going to be, I don't know, no market for drugs. Most likely it's going to be more demand. Uh, and if it remains illegal, then the incentives for these groups to regulate these markets using violence is going to be there as well. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's, those are my, my two points there. Thank you very much. So let me just pass over. Thanks. Yeah, I have some th comments on legalization as well. I mean, I agree with everything Santiago just said. Uh, I would personally be in favor of l drug legalization. Uh, uh, but, you know, a couple of points. First of all, you know, legalization or decriminalization, that actual real world decriminalization has mostly been about marijuana, maybe mushrooms or someone, you know, psychedelics. It's not really about cocaine or heroin. And those are the drugs that cause organized, that's where the profits are, that's where organized crime is, that's where organized crime violence is, and that's where criminal governance is for the most part. So I'm not that hopeful. And I don't see proposals to legalize cocaine. I don't see countries that are like, yeah. what's that? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but you know, I, I don't, I don't see, and I don't see Latin American countries having the political autonomy to say we're going to legalize cocaine. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen or we shouldn't work towards it. I'm just saying in the short term, I don't see that happening. The other thing I want to say is that, in, in part of what I'm trying to get at in this book, and I also have a companion piece that's like a formal model that talks a little bit about the political economy here. You really, I think we, one thing we miss about this is that by illegalizing dr markets like cocaine and heroin, very lucrative markets already. We know from sort of classic economic models like Becker, uh, you know, if you if you if you repress and you reduce supply for a good that has inelastic demand, as drugs do, you increase the revenues and potentially the profits of that market. There's almost no doubt that these drug markets are vastly more profitable because they're illegal, right? And those profits, what do they go to? Well, they go to competition among drug gangs. If there's enough competition among them, they compete away all the profits. If they have monopolies like local monopolies, like corner street corner gangs do, then they get to keep some of those profits. But a lot of those resources, in my argument, go into local governance. That's what, those are the resources that gangs use to govern these urban peripheries. So we have a system that has taken a, a market for illegal, illegal drugs, demonized it, associated it with impoverished, informal urban neighborhoods, it's fostered criminal organizations that are able to administer that market, profit off of it, and ultimately channel those resources into governance over areas that the state would just as soon not have to deal with. That is a very entrenched problem. It's not just a question at this point, after 30 or 40 years, of simply, okay, well, let's legalize drugs and, and we can wash our hands of this problem. I would say it's like a deep structural problem about the way that industrialization and urbanization has played out, at least in Latin America, and I think we need to also start looking around the world at other places where this phenomenon may be happening at local levels that aren't even being perceived, right? Where, well, who are the criminal organizations that provide low-level local governance in the urban peripheries around the world? Have people gone to those peripheries and found out, are there criminal gangs that are s resolving disputes for people? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's an important research agenda, especially as the drug trade moves into Western Africa uh, and other parts of the world uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. Let's just stay on the topic of drugs and then come back to the other um, questions. So I think there's a big difference between decriminalization and legalization. And my understanding is that um, Portugal has decriminalized the personal use of drugs, yeah, or drugs, but it's not legal. You can't go and legally buy it. Yeah, s it. sell it or produce it. Yeah, so it's a big difference. Um, so uh, let's keep this in mind in our uh, in our discussion here. And I think Portugal has been a lot in the headlines. We've got quite a few Portuguese here who could help us out on this. But my understanding is that actually before the decriminalization came in, uh, there was a de facto non-prosecution already in force. And that is actually the case in a lot of other countries as well on personal possession, not dealing. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, bring my two cents on the uh, decriminalization or legalization uh, discussion. And I think part of this comes from, it's, it's a vicious circle between governments and, and public opinion. I think, unfortunately, there's a, cons a, a widespread conception of drug use as something that is extremely um, horrendous and destroys lives, etc. Uh, and it's, 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 uncomfortable to say this, but the reality and the evidence from a, a public health point of view shows that the great majority of drug users are functioning normal people. 
just like most people who drink alcohol are not alcoholics, most people who use cocaine or heroin are not, in fact, uh, addicted or have a horrendous life. Uh, so we feed this narrative and we feed this sort of uh, alternative reality and we sell it to public opinion. And since most people in public opinion do not use cocaine or heroin or opioids, etc., they buy into this narrative and they push for governments to uh, keep uh, drugs illegal, et cetera, et cetera, and it, it feeds off itself. It's a, it's a, it's a closed loop. And I think uh, academia has to play a role in this to sort of uh, broaden the discussion and the reality that from a, from a public health point of view, a public health perspective of what drug use is really like, and, uh, and of course, link it in with, uh, with the, horrible, the horrible impact of organized crime in terms of violence, et cetera. So I think we really need to expand the, the, this discussion. And it's, it, it's not something that's going to be easy, but I think, I think we need to make, make the push for this. And on this, you can read Carl Hart, who has done some um, uh, research on, on this. OK, everybody got very excited about this question, but let's move on to some other question. One was uh, addressed to Gianmarco specifically about the uh, on-the-ground conditions that change. Yeah. yeah uh, mm. So what the commissioner do is to, for instance, in the case of infiltration into public uh, procurements, is uh, to uh, change the con these conditions. So if the public procurement was assigned to a firm related to mafia, that's an action uh, that uh, they undertake, for instance. So the management of the public uh, budget is important. A second, I think uh, there is a symbolic value, especially in cases where the infiltration of the mafia is more recent and uh, citizens are not uh, totally hopeless. It's an important sign to see that uh, the state, uh, the national government took a decision on a very specific uh, community, uh, you know, to send uh, technocrats. So I, see, I think for some uh, uh, citizen, uh, this, uh, um, this has a value. And then there is also an, um, um, a police-related aspect. So if uh, there are evidence of ties between a politician or more than one and uh, uh, mafias, of course, uh, they will start an investigation that will take, uh, you know, years, but that show that, uh, you know, the state, the police is more present, active in that community, so that uh, can also have, a, you know, a deterrence effect uh, on the presence of uh, a criminal organization in that, uh, in that city. And then uh, I wanted to reply also another question about uh, more uh, bottom-up uh, uh, approach. Uh, so in Italy there was uh, this big crackdown at the beginning of the 90s following the murder of two judges. And uh, this was also the start of uh, a widespread social movements uh, in uh, Sicily against uh, uh, mafia. And uh, uh, nowadays there are many NGO working uh, on uh, um, anti-mafia in Sicily. So for instance, they are very successful in uh, promoting uh, small shops uh, to join uh, anti-racketing movement, uh, uh, displaying a sign saying that uh, you know, they do not pay uh, to the mafia. Um, so uh, this is extremely important. It's about the cultural change. And it's related also to what they were, in their presentation, they were talking about the support of the population for those. Cultural changes, of course, are extremely, um, are, are difficult and they take uh, time. But uh, the Italian experience on this is that uh, a big shock that was the murder of two uh, important uh, uh, judges fighting mafia was uh, a, a turning point uh, on this. And, um, Another issue, uh, all, the all those policies are clearly limitation because they deal with the these long-term problems. So there is a cultural aspect that I mentioned, and then there is an economic one. That is the fact that those are poor area with high level of unemployment, so there is a kind of uh, rational. If uh, I have no alternative, you know, I go after those uh, uh, organizations. So those are, you know, um, long-term issues. Thank you. Let's hear from Andres, and I think then we'll have to uh, draw to a close. I also wanted to address what the gentleman brought up about the grassroots and bottom-up approaches. And uh, another uncomfortable truth we often overlook is that many of these gangs are, in fact, uh, uh, sort of grassroots organizations themselves. And uh, in many cases, uh, they, at least I, I experienced this in Cali when, in, in my tenure as a Secretary of Security in Cali, but I think in Medellin is true and probably true in many other cities around the world, is they, they operate and they provide significant 
services for, for the community uh, from a grassroots level. So I think it, it, it would be interesting to see how, and, and that's partly the approach we took in Cali, how do we, instead of seeing gangs as necessarily evil or necessarily negative, try to bring them into the sort of social fabric and see how they can, we can reduce the harm that they, that they that comes from, for instance, uh, the violence associated to gangs, et cetera, and see how we can make them part of the social network and, and sort of the social fabric of the community and, and try to build legitimacy from the bottom up. And uh, I think uh, we can, just like we see governments usually taking steps from the, from the top to, to, to the bottom, uh, likewise, I think um, we, we also uh, approach the, the solution to violence from, from a top bottom uh, approach like dismantling drug cartels or signing a peace deal with the FARC. But that usually, even when that happens, it generates a huge void that oftentimes is filled from the bottom up. So it'd be interesting to see if we can uh, take a more uh, alternative approach to see how we can make or understand the, the grassroots components of these organizations and try to uh, weave them into the social fabric and, and, and uh, sort of empower the positive aspects that they bring and try to limit the harm that they, that they generate as well. Okay, one quick comment. If this is just a, something to add on to that. It goes back to the legalization thing. Again, I agree that we're very, very far from true legalization. But a piece of legalization that's being discussed in Brazil, it's being discussed in the US, has to do with reparations to people who were drug traffickers and once drug trafficking becomes legal, right? So you were imprisoned for dealing pot and now pot's legal, you deserve some reparation. Well, there's a case to be made that in a world like that, some of these people, their abilities as <coughs> provisioners of local governance, taking care of their communities, should be taken advantage of, right? And those people should be, uh, you know, in, uh, recruited and incorporated into government, local governance structures as part of some kind of reparations package. Now, that's way politically out of the pale right now, but it's something to think about for the future.